Today we're going to be chatting around alternative investments, not uh, geared products in any sense, exchange traded funds, exchange traded notes. My name is Simon Brown. I'm joined by Brett Duncan from Standard Bank Retail Equity Derivatives. Brett, we've seen a, 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 an explosion in ETS and ETNs since Satrix listed over a decade ago. And really it's given the, the range of products that an individual can invest in. I suppose trading at the same time, although they're not geared products, that, that range has just absolutely exploded, which is ideal for investors and traders, gives you those different products. Yes, Simon, I really think that what we've seen, is, as you rightly say, is an explosion in, in choice. Uh, suddenly you as the retail investor, we as retail investors, are able to trade in multiple asset classes, local and international markets all in one place being the JSE and it really has opened up uh, the ability to diversify one's portfolio and to gain exposure to previously unattainable um, markets for us as retail investors. It's actually a very, very exciting time. Yeah, the one I use is, is oil. If you had a view on oil, you had to go in and engage with Sassel. Now you can go and buy an ETN on oil and that makes it a whole different, um, different game, makes it a whole lot easier and a whole lot cleaner. Let's touch on some of those exchange-traded notes uh, from Standard Bank. This was the first four that they brought out, the gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. You can see their codes there. Gold, for example, SBAG1, and then AS1 for silver, APL1 for platinum, and, and uh, APD1 for palladium. Red gold we had had, that had been, been a gold ETF for a long time, bringing in silver, platinum, and palladium, particularly the silver, where you couldn't get exposure on, on, on the South African exchange. Platinum and palladium, you we're getting exposure via the miners, nice, but that brings in operational risk. Correct. So just to take a step back, Simon, I think that firstly to, to position exactly what an exchange traded note is for any of the listers out there. Um, exchange traded notes are instruments issued by the bank uh, with the obligation is from the bank to provide you with the performance of the underlying asset over which they're issued. So slightly different from an exchange traded fund which would go and buy the underlying uh, investments directly and hold them uh, in the correct proportion. Here you have instruments where the bank might well go and buy the underlines, but you actually just look to the bank for the performance. You want that move. Gold moves X, your, your, your ETN moves X. Correct. And the important thing to realize when you're trading in ETNs is that you're taking on the credit risk of the counterparty. So it's a debt instrument issued by the bank and you will look to the bank to make good in its obligation. Obviously Standard Bank being the biggest of the local banks is a counterparty which most people would be comfortable with. So back to your question, what are we looking to do? Well we're looking to provide instruments that in RANDs, because this is a, an important point for people to realize, track the movement of the underlying. And when we're talking about the the four products that you've got listed on the screen there. We have uh, a, a RAND tracker for the, for the RAND gold price, uh, for the RAND silver price, for the RAND platinum price, and for the RAND palladium price. So for many of us out there, uh, you know, whenever historically we wanted to get exposure to gold, we've gone and bought gold shares, Anglo gold, gold fields. You can have different things going on because you're looking to get the direct performance of the underlying commodity, but by buying it via the company, there could be something else going on. The company could have a large strike that could cause problems uh -huh. for the share price, even though the gold price continues to go up. The company could have a production problems because one of its refineries breaks down. And so whilst the gold price is going up, you don't see that translating into underlying. So what you end up with is, a not, uh, not that it's uncorrelated, but not directly correlated instrument, being the gold company, what you're trading to try and get the gold price. So we've said, let's take away the company-specific aspects. Let's come up with instruments, list them through our ETN program that, that give us the ability to track the physical RAND gold price, the physical silver price, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they are cash settled. You're not going to get a bar of palladium or silver, as the case may be. Um, and they're not leveraged instruments, uh, although Standard Bank might be creating that movement by using futures. As we buy them on the market, they're not leveraged instruments, so we don't get that leverage effect. We're getting that, that relationship as gold or silver, platinum, palladium in rands is moving. These will track them. I remember the silver one when it listed, I think in its first six or eight months, silver went completely crazy and that ETN more than doubled in price as silver was rocking on the world markets and moving up in dollars 
you multiply that into the rands and you get a rand silver price that had done significantly stronger as well. Those were the initial four that were brought to market. Then a, a whole bunch more uh, ETNs that came through, a couple more commodities, wheat, oil, copper. Again, Brett, that's really just expanding it a bit. Certainly, uh, wheat was something which, which did exposure to. You had to go to suffix, you had to go trade agricultural futures. Oil, we would have to go for Cecil. Copper, there's, there's one or two copper mines listed in South Africa. But again, we got that the company on top, which brought risk or potential reward to it. This makes it, if you've got a view on a, on a particular commodity, nice, clean, easy. You do it in a normal equity account, trade it through a normal stockbroker. Correct, Simon. And I think really what you've seen is as these products are be becoming more and more popular, you're going to see them over a, a whole plethora of different uh, of, of different instruments. Uh, wheat, obviously, it was natural if we had hard commodities to add a soft commodity, mm -hmm. wheat being the most commonly traded here in South African terms. Oil, I mean, hardly a day goes by when, when we're not hearing about something potentially in the Middle East or, you know, something that's affecting the oil price. The whole world economy really driven by what's happening in the oil price. So it was a natural uh, uh, instrument for us to bring to market. As you so often say, for the last however many years, when we thought of oil, we all used to go and trade Sassel. But now there's the opportunity to trade oil price directly. Copper, massively important, especially when one's looking at the, at the health of the world economy, what's going on in the building market. Uh, copper, one of the most actively traded commodities globally, was a natural place for us to, to also look to expand the product range. And then moving on to our index-based commodities that we brought out is, if you think about it, you can go and buy the underlyings directly, but why not have within one ETN the ability to track a basket of commodities? And that's exactly what we've tried to do with the Standard Bank Commodity Index. Suddenly you have an instrument that gives you exposure to precious metals, base metals, agriculture and energy all within one product. So you really get an overall commodities instrument. That's for the person who is bullish on commodities. And, and when you're bullish on commodities, much as we've often spoken about an index, you might be bullish on commodities, but uh, today copper might be weak while this one's going there or something like that. This says that my view going forward is that commodities is a good place to be, and this then gives you that exposure into them. If you break them down into the individuals, gold, platinum, copper, aluminium, corn, wheat, and oil, and oil, oddly enough, being one of the biggest of, in that index, we, we think of Africa, we often don't think of oil, but of course, if we go north, there's a lot of oil happening there, a lot of oil exploration happening in Nigeria, most of their revenue coming from oil, so it really gives us a, a great exposure to commodities in one simple basket. Correct. This is very much designed for the investor that believes that they want to have an underpin of commodities or a portion of their portfolio in commodities. They would like to not go and invest in each of the individuals. They'd like to have a basket. And it's really for the, for the guy that feels that they might want to hold on to that instrument for, for many years to come because they just believe commodities are a happening place and that they want 20% of their portfolio in that. In the same kind of theme, um, we all live in Africa and have exposure to Africa. But what we've, we, we, is through South African companies, but what we've had a lot of demand for is the ability to get exposure to Africa, ex-South Africa. The real, uh, I'm thinking places like Nigeria, I mean the obvious ones, uh, Zambia and countries like that, exceedingly difficult to actually get true exposure to those for typ typically for South Africa. Correct. A, a lot of these markets are what we would call frontier markets. So, you know, one talks about the likes of... Uh, of Uganda and Tunisia and Cote d'Ivoire, you know, markets traditionally, I personally have never traded and more than likely you haven't traded. Wouldn't know how to, to be honest. Correct, but it would be nice to have when one's talking about an overall portfolio. If you buy into Africa, you know, one of the last true really uh, frontier markets globally, somewhere where you expect significant growth over the coming decades, uh, to have an instrument that gives you exposure en masse to that. So, you know, through this instrument, the, the Standard Bank Africa Equity Index, you get exposure to 179 different companies, 103 of those listed directly on, South, on African exchanges. Uh, so, you know, a certain number of them will be listed on the Nigerian exchange, a certain number on uh, the Botswana exchange. And then because we find that it's a fairly illiquid place, Africa still, and it's getting more and more liquid over time, but, you know, in order to give the investor a real flavor of Africa, 
We also have 76 stocks that whilst they're not listed on African exchanges or their primary listing is not on African exchanges, that the bulk of their revenue is generated in Africa. And then we have this very, very inclusive index of 179 shares in one instrument being the, the Standard Bank Africa Equity Index that really gives you exposure to Africa Ex of South Africa yeah. as a continent. Yeah, excluding South Africa, the two biggest countries, Nigeria, that makes absolute perfect sense. Uh, Kenya in at number three. Egypt at number two. And I've got to say, I, I was surprised to see that. But when you think about it, well, yeah, I mean, Egypt is a, is a large economy on, on, on the continent. And, and it's going to give you that, that, that exposure to Africa as a growth story. We often talk about uh, BRICS and we say Africa is a billion people. It's almost a China or an India on its own and how we can get exposure to it. And what's important, because these are, are, are ETNs and how they're listed, there's market makers there. They're in the market. They're buying and selling. So you trade them at fair value. And they trade on the JSC. So trade them through your stockbroker as you would a normal equity with, as we said, that exposure either to individual commodities, mostly hards and then wheat being the soft, or a basket via the commodity index, or Africa, excluding South Africa via the Standard Bank Africa Equity Index. A couple of important points, Brett, they're up there on, on, on the right there. There's no gearing. They, they're liquid because of the market maker being there. Uh, you're not going to need to own the physical. You're also not going to get the physical. You're not going to get your bars or anything. Cost effective, nice and easy, you're paying your standard brokerage rate, you're buying yourself an ETN, it's simple, you don't have to worry about all the issues around owning commodities, and in truth, for most of us as investors, we don't want to have to worry about the actual process of owning commodities, we want exposure to the price movements, we don't want the grey hairs that come with them. You also see the URL there, commodity linkers, standardbank.coza slash commodity linkers, if you want to go and delve a lot deeper into them. Yes, and that's something that I really encourage anyone who's going to be getting into the commodities to go and have a look at because there is quite a lot of information there on how we actually do the, 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 the rolling of these products through all the different expiries because actually the commodity linkers are uh, based, uh, we do our hedging through the futures market. What's nice about it is these are continuous instruments for the end user, but there's actually hedging that goes on behind the scenes where we move through the different contracts and there can be benefits that accrue to the user from that. But I think really the point that we'd like to make is commodities as an asset class becoming very important globally and becoming are very important globally. But the real kicker for commodities in a balanced portfolio is it's one of the true uncorrelated asset classes that we see. Uh, we found in recent years that many asset classes tend to move in the same m m way which means that adding these asset classes to your portfolio doesn't necessarily give you diversification. Whereas commodities as an asset class, it's been proven that adding them to an investment portfolio provides significant diversification. Uh, commodities also, and in an inflationary world, and we're starting to see inflation rear its ugly head again, commodities are a very important way of protecting yourself against inflation. Because as you see inflation, you tend to see commodity prices adjust to that inflation and in many cases exceed that inflation. So if you're looking to inflation protect your portfolio, commodities become very important. Yeah, it's a point we made up front, but that explosion of options available to, to the investor, no longer is it just buying equities, now we can get real diversified portfolios. And as Brett says, you want assets that are uncorrelated, so that if 2008, 2009 is happening and equities are under the cosh, there are potentially other assets out there that are, if not holding their own, they might be rising, they might only be holding their own, but in 2008, holding your own was a winning year. Exchange traded funds, Probably I think most people have got a fair grasp of what they are, a basket of stocks uh, typically reflecting an index. Uh, Stanlib are doing two of them. Um, the SWIX uh, 40 ETF, the top 40 ETF. Let's start with the top 40 one first. That really is a, a very simple product in that it takes the top 40 index, which I think most of, our, uh, of, of the people watching this video understand. It's the index of the 40 largest shares in the market. And what it says is that rather than you having to go and buy those 40 stocks individually to get exposure, you can simply you go and buy this ETF and you get exposure to the broad market. Correct. So ETFs very, very popular. Many, many investors would be aware of the Satrix 40. Uh, Stanlib having its uh, Swix ETF. Really, this is the shareholder weighted version of the top 40, which downweights some of the international stocks, which tend to uh, be the, the big gorillas in the room, which tend to overweight the local top 40 index. So for investors that are looking more for a, a more balanced portfolio, the SWIX becomes quite interesting. Uh, then also offering the top 40 on the Stanlib ETF, 
Uh, really, the, the difference between ETFs and ETNs, and, and I mentioned it earlier, is that the ETF will go and buy the physical they underlying. literally physically have the stocks that make up the basket. Correct. So you don't have the credit risk of an ETN. So for, for very conservative investors, ETFs uh, become quite pop, uh, popular because they don't have any credit risk on them because the fund itself holds the underlying shares directly. The, the, the other things we can use them for, I mean, as, as, as it says there, SWIX often used as, as a benchmark. It's also a nice underpinning for a portfolio. I typically have a, a good third or even 40% of my portfolio sitting in exchange-traded funds, and that's my market performance. I'm going to get whatever the market does. And then on top of that, I build a, a portfolio of a couple of select stocks that I've picked to try and get that out performance. But those ETS gives me that base of whatever the market is doing, I'm, being, I'm going to get that return year on and year out. Uh, ETFs very much, and uh, without getting into too much jargon, uh, for those for those investors out there that like to to talk like fund managers, you know the ETF itself, the top 40 ETF, giving you the beta performance mm -hmm. of your portfolio, beta being the performance of the market, and then as you say, you're going to be a little bit of a stock picker around that and some other shares trying to outperform the market to capture so what we would call alpha, that outperformance above the index. And of course they trade in the JSC, you can buy them via a traditional stockbroker. My name is Simon Brown, I've been chatting with Brett Duncan, looking at some of the alternative products that have come out of Standard Bank and the Standard Bank Group. You can find details warrants.co.za. Brett Duncan is from Standard Bank Retail Equity Derivatives.